here. Tonight is my privilege to present Atesh and Donna from the Cellular and Developmental Bio Department at UCSC. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Thank you all for being here on this beautiful Monday evening. Um, my name is Donna Postavo, as Amanda mentioned. And my name is Atesh Worthington, and we are both graduate students up at UC Santa Cruz in Dr. Camilla Forsberg's lab, studying hematopoiesis, which is just a fancy word for blood development. And in, uh, in a celebration of women in science, I thought we'd give a little intro about ourselves. So um, my journey in science really began as an undergrad here at UC Santa Cruz where I had the opportunity to be involved in undergraduate research as well as uh, participate in an internship in uh, pharmaceutical development, and that really sparked my interest in research. So I pursued uh, research at Duke after graduating and uh, was interested in how the brain develops, and then after that I came back to UC Santa Cruz and I've been in the PhD program there for now, I'm starting my fourth year. So, what about you, Donna? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tash. <laughs> um, my experience in science really began um, at the University of Hawaii, where I did my undergraduate studies. Uh, there, I participated in diverse topics of research, um, from studying endangered tree snails to studying coral pathogens. Um, in the summers, I also participated in summer research programs where I learned a lot about stem cells. Um, so I pursued a master's degree at SF State and did my research at UCSF, looking at the um, uh, involvement of stem cells in bone fracture repair. And to further pursue my interest in stem cells, I'm now pursuing my PhD in the Forsberg lab, um, studying stem cells in the blood. Yeah. Um, so blood. Cool. All right. So blood. Um, we all know that the blood is vitally important. Blood is this liquid tissue that um, not only carries oxygen and fights infection throughout our body, but it also carries these messenger molecules that transport information from cell to cell, from tissue to tissue, and from organ to organ, thereby really connecting um, the health of our entire body. And the importance of blood is, um, is seen throughout life. It is vital to our health during fetal development in the womb. It's, it's important to allow us to play as children and to train and thrive in graduate school here at UCSC. Um, and to maybe uh, become uh, principal investigators like a PI here. This is Kamala Forsberg. And hopefully, it will maintain our health um, when we become grandmothers like ours. But just like all other tissues, the blood is also susceptible to diseases throughout life. During childhood, for example, we may be affected by um, uh, leukemias, um, hemophilia, and other uh, blood diseases like sickle cell disease. In adulthood, we might be affected by anemia, uh, other forms of leukemia, as well as um, blood clots. And during old age, we're even more susceptible to these diseases, uh, such as cardiovascular diseases like stroke, thrombocytopenia, or too few platelets, or thrombocytosis, which is too many platelets, as well as uh, other blood diseases. And so, really, here this depicts the, the need to understand the mechanisms that regulate blood throughout life. So, Really, what is blood? What are the cellular components of blood? And Donna kind of highlighted this already. Um, and when we think of all of the different cells in the blood, you see that over 99% of the cellular components are red blood cells and platelets. And that's not too surprising, right? Because of the daily need for every single cell in our body to receive oxygen. Oxygen is necess necessary for the life of every cell. Um, but this other 1% is also very interesting. These are our white blood cells, and Donna mentioned these are cells that are constantly 
surveying for foreign invaders and pathogens and keeping us healthy from infection. And briefly, we call them white blood cells, but the ones we're going to be talking about today are granulocytes and macrophages, B cells, and T cells. And when we look at all of these mature cells that are in our blood, how do we think of them in terms of their relation to one another? And in the field, we usually think of trees, but not necessarily this type of tree that you see on campus or all around Santa Cruz. We really think about trees of blood or hematopoietic trees. And so this tree depicts the process of hematopoiesis. And as you can see down here at the bottom, we have all the mature cells that I just mentioned, and these are circulating in the blood, but really the process of hematopoiesis, the process of blood development, begins in the bone marrow with the stem cell. And the stem cell has two really amazing properties. One, it can self-renew, meaning it can make more of itself indefinitely for the life of an organism, and it can also differentiate and give rise to other cell types. And so the very first step of differentiation gives rise to a progenitor cell, and these progenitor cells do not self-renew, and through each level of differentiation, we get more and more restricted uh, progenitors. So they uh, decrease the number of cell types that they can make as they mature, and eventually make our mature cells, which are called terminally differentiated. They can no longer make other cell types. That's the end of the line. Um, but what we're really interested in the lab are these stem cells at the very top of this hierarchical tree. And as I mentioned, a stem cell has two properties, right? It can self-renew, so make more of itself, and it can also differentiate. And these two properties must remain in balance throughout the life of an organism, because if we have too much self-renewal, it can lead to types of cancers of the blood. However, if we have too much differentiation, this is an example of bone marrow failure. Either of these possibilities are detrimental to the life of the organism. Um, however, it's these two properties that also make stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, or HSCs, as I'll be calling them for the rest of the talk, um, that make them so important and so vital to therapies that we use every day. So because they have this regenerative capacity, what we can do in the clinic is actually take healthy hematopoietic stem cells and transplant them intravenously into a patient requiring one of these stem cell transplant therapies. And it's pretty amazing how effective these transplants are in saving lives. But how do we even figure out what a stem cell is, what it looks like, what these other progenitors, and how do we connect all of the cells in that tree? Have any answers? I think I have one. <laughs> so how do we identify and understand these cells? In the lab, we use a tool called FATS. It stands for fluorescence activated cell sort. And this tool allows us to detect and measure physical and chemical characteristics of a population of mixed cells. And it begins with us harvesting cells from bone marrow or the blood and putting it in a liquid suspension. We then add these um, engineered antibodies. Really cool what happens in this box. Um, and I'm going to do my best to describe this to you. Um, how it works is you put your sample in the box and using uh, microfluidics, your, um, the machine is able to separate your, your, uh, your sample into single cells. And so it detects from a mixed population one cell at a time. And it looks at each cell using optical lasers and so um, as depicted in this drawing, uh, one cell passes through a laser and um, by optics we can gain insight into what that cell is, what's on the cell, what's the size of the cell, really just a full analysis in real time. And we can analyze thousands of cells per second. So, so it, as you would imagine, it's a really powerful tool to allow us to study blood, for example, which contains a lot of cells. Um, another important aspect of this uh, technique or technology is that we can sort specific cells. And so we might be interested in hematopoietic stem cell, for example, or HSC. We can then purify that from our mixed population. And at the end, we can uh, gather our data and present them in a two-dimensional plot like this one, where each dot here 
Um, it's a collection of dots if you can't see. Each dot represents a single cell. Um, and in this graph, um, they all, the pop this population of cell is also depicted as a little blob. I don't know if you see that, or a cloud. Um, and in this example, this population of cell is positive for fluorescence A and fluorescence B. It's just how to read this graph. Whereas this population of cells is negative for fluorescence A and fluorescence B. But one big problem that we have in hematopoiesis is that we can't study hematopoiesis in detail in living people, obviously. We can take a few drops of blood and perform sophisticated testing, but we usually have to perform invasive procedures to look at the hematopoietic components um, in the bone marrow and in the blood, and we have to do so repeatedly throughout our life in order to really understand the changes that occur as we live. Um, and so, in the lab, we turn to mice. And using facts, we can then purify our cells of interest in this case, it's a stem cell. And to determine the identity of a cell, in this case it's a stem cell, we transplant them. Uh, we transplant them into mice and allow them to, for those cells, to regenerate the hematopoietic system of the host. Then we harvest those cells, those stem cells, again, and then re-transplant them once more to another recipient, and then determine if they can once again regenerate the blood. And this process is called serial transplantation, and it is a gold standard in the field for determining if a cell of interest is in fact a stem cell. Okay, um, and one really cool way we can under, um, track these cells and their progeny is by fluorescence. And in the lab, we use a transgenic mouse called Flick switch mouse to study hematopoiesis. And this mouse is a lineage tracing model. What does that mean? Lineage tracing because it allows us to detect the expression or history of expression of a gene. And what makes this flick switch mouse really special is that their blood is fluorescent. Yes, that's right, they glow. Um, and in fact, they have the potential to glow two colors. In this case, the color is tomato, or the color is green. Now you probably notice that, oh, and, and this here is a depiction of these genes. And you probably notice that these two genes are separated by a stop signal. And so really, the only color that is expressed is a tomato fluorescence because it has stopped before expression of the green fluorescence. Okay, and to trace blood cells, we are interested in the expression of a gene called FLIC2. FLIC2 is uh, specific to hematopoietic cells. And when this gene is turned on, it signals a switch from tomato to green expression. And it does so by using DNA cutting machinery. And so the take home message here is that when FLIC2 is expressed, there is a color switch from tomato positive cells to green positive cells. And because this switch is irreversible, once it is the cell is green, it remains green. So we use this system, this colorful system, to study hematopoiesis in mice. Here you're looking at fax plots, uh, real life examples of fax plots, where in this example, the, um, the axes on the left, the y axis is tomato and the x axis is green. And here the population of cells is occupying quadrant that signifies expression of the tomato color. So therefore, these cells are tomato positive. Now in the flick switch mice, oh, and these are specific to the HFCs or stem cells. And in the flick switch mice, 
uh, flick is turned on at the first progenitor stage. This means that when flick is turned on, if you remember, the color switches from tomato to green. And so now the population of cells is occupying the green space. And uh, the switch is irreversible, meaning all downstream progenitors and mature cells in all the lineages are green. And so the take-home message here is that the stem cell, or the HOC, is tomato positive, while all progenitors and uh, mature cells are green positive. And um, this will become important as we look at all of the HOCs throughout life. And so the, the switching occurs because of an expression of a gene. So if you see right here, um, flick to the way we've engineered the mice is so that the enzyme that does the cutting here that causes this tomato and stop signal to be removed, that enzyme is only expressed when flick 2 is expressed. So it's kind of, the power of this lineage tracing model is really to trace the history of expression. So if a cell has come from a progenitor that has expressed this gene at any point upon its development, that cell will also remain green. So, Here's a tree of hematopoiesis during adulthood, but as Donna mentioned, um, this is, or potentially mentioned, this is not necessarily what happens all throughout life. And in fact, we have uh, stem cells from the very beginning until the very end, and these pools of stem cells are different. So, the stem cells that arise during fetal development are different from those that we have during our adult life and are different from those that we have during our golden years. Um, and really, these stem cells differ in many properties, and we hypothesize that this is due to them trying to meet the needs of the organism at each stage of life. Um, and I'm particularly interested in fetal development. So these fetal stem cells here, where do they come from? Uh, what do they look like? What do they do? And in particular, I'm interested in how these stem cells um, differ from adult stem cells in their ability to make the immune system. So we said, right, stem cells make red blood cells, they make white blood cells as well. So what do these white blood cells do? So our immune system is important in keeping us healthy and safe from foreign invaders, constantly surveying in the blood as it circulates. And we have, um, or the immune system responds in two ways. The very first way is through an innate response. And this innate response, maybe you've heard, is fast. It is nonspecific. And these are considered the very first responders in an immune response. And uh, just for a little information, in terms of the tree, the innate response lies within these granulocytes and macrophages. And then the other response is called the adaptive immune response, and this consists of our Bs and T cells. And this is much slower, it is specific, and it gains a memory. So it's specific, it has a memory because it has to learn, it has to adapt to what is invading the body. And for the longest time, this is how the immune system was thought of, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. And then roughly 15-ish years ago, we discovered that there are other cell types that don't necessarily fall within the innate immune system or the adaptive immune system. And in fact, they're thought to naturally bridge the slow, I mean, sorry, the fast <laughs> innate response with the slow adaptive response. And what was so fascinating about these cell types when they were discovered was we found out that adult stem cells cannot make these. How is that possible? How is it that we have cells in our adult body, but our adult stem cells can't make them? And so you might wonder, where do they come from? They come from waves. Waves. Well, not necessarily the types of waves you would see at Natural Bridges Beach. Rather, they come from waves of developmental hematopoiesis here. Here. Um, and so these waves occur at different times during embryonic development and originate from different tissues in the developing organism. And here's a graph depicting these waves. And on the bottom we have, we have time, or the age of the organism, E referring to embryonic day, 
And then, so E7.5, E9.5, E14.5, birth, and then adulthood. And by the way, this is all in terms of a mouse of lifespan. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have the activity or the production of those cell types, or production of progenitors during those waves. And so the very first wave occurs, occurs at E7.5, and it gives rise to red blood cells. So this is the very beginning of the hematopoietic system. And then a few days later, we have subsequent waves that give rise to platelets and white blood cells. And these arise from another tissue within the developing embryo. And then a little later on, we have what is called a wave of definitive hematopoiesis. And this is uh, where our lifelong hematopoietic stem cells arise from. And they go through this very complex uh, migration starting in what is called the aorta gonadomus nephros and then eventually migrates to the fetal liver and eventually migrates from there to the bone marrow where they are there for the life of the organism. And so you're probably wondering, well, what about these special immune cells that bridge the gap? Where do they come from? Well, super, super excitingly, our lab actually discovered a population of cells that gives rise to these special immune cells. And so this happens during um, embryonic development and it's most notable at embryonic day 14.5, this is the time point in which we first discovered these cell types. And these cell types were discovered in the flick switch model, which Donna described uh, just a moment ago. So if you remember, the flick switch model of hematopoiesis, we have our hematopoietic stem cell that is red, and then all uh, progenitors and mature cells are GFP positive. Green, excuse me, the lingo just comes. <laughs> um, however, very interestingly, our novel cell population is actually green, so it, um, it is not red, which is very surprising, or not tomato, which is very surprising for us. <laughs> um, and interestingly, these uh, cells that we found, we termed developmentally restricted HSCs, or hematopoietic stem cells, are able to give rise to all of the normal uh, cells that we see in the blood that are circulating, but additionally, they give rise to these specialized immune cells. Um, but of note, they, because they are green, they cannot give rise to our definitive long-term hematopoietic stem cells, and therefore, we hypothesize that they arise in a parallel wave. And this is kind of the, the beauty of using this flick switch model. Um, and when we look at the relative abundance of these cell types throughout life, we see that you know, the lifelong HSC emerges during that embryonic window and is sustained throughout life, whereas this developmentally restricted HSC has a very narrow window of development. It's, it has the most number of cells around E14.5 and eventually sputters off and is no longer around in adulthood. Actually, in the mouse, it's around two weeks of age when they are completely gone. Um, but you might ask, if they do not self-renew indefinitely, how can we call them an HSC? How can we call them an actual stem cell? Because we defined a stem cell as a cell that can both self-renew and differentiate. <laughs> Well, if you remember, we talked about uh, the gold standard for defining a stem cell, and this is a serial transplantation. And in fact, what we can do, if we harvest these cells from the embryo, we can take them and put them into an adult, and they will regenerate the hematopoietic system of the adult. And then from there, we can harvest them once more and put them back into another adult, and they will regenerate the hematopoietic system of that adult, which is impressive. We did not expect this when we first found this cell type. And so, unlike all the other waves during hematopoiesis, DRHSCs are actually capable of serial transplantation. And so they are indeed hematopoietic stem cells. And very interestingly, upon each transplantation, they retain this ability to make these specialized immune cells. So not only do they gain self-renewal when we transplant them, which is mind-blowing, it also retains this very specific lineage potential, which adult HSCs lose. So that was, uh, when we discovered this, it was probably one of the most exciting things for the lab, until some other exciting stuff that Donald will talk to you about. Um, and so, really, the defining properties of hematopoietic stem cells we found are uniquely altered in this developmentally restricted HSC. And because they're able to gain self-renewal while maintaining this differentiation potential, 
they've really created this novel and powerful platform for us to now go forward and try to understand uh, mechanisms that regulate hematopoietic function, hematopoietic stem cell function. And so the goal of my project moving forward is to really understand what regulates DRHSC self-renewal and differentiation. And this question becomes very important when we think about how we use HSCs in the clinic. And so, like I said, we can harvest healthy hematopoietic stem cells and put them into uh, patients and uh, cure, in essence, many um, blood disorders. But unfortunately, uh, every year in the U.S., there are over 20,000 patients that require these stem cell transplants, and we just don't have enough suitable donors to uh, uh, used for transplantation therapies. And so this creates a huge clinical need to be able to supply patients with hematopoietic stem cells. And one of the avenues that's been pursued is to grow hematopoietic stem cells in a dish. However, our biggest limitation is that they really do not survive in a dish. We can harvest them from uh, an adult, we can harvest them from cord blood, and we can keep them in a dish for roughly a week. But after that, when we try transplanting, try transplanting them, they are very, very poor at regenerating, if at all, at being able to regenerate the hematopoietic system. And so, by understanding the mechanisms that regulate hematopoietic stem cell function through the lens of development, through this DRHSC that I just introduced to you, the goal is really to be able one day maybe use what we learn and uh, potentially grow them in a dish or uh, be able to manipulate them at will. And so further down the road, actually I'm starting it right now in my thesis, but, um, all right, so the goal is to be able to grow HSCs in a dish, but further down the road, the goal is not just grow them, but really to be able to control HSCs. So instead of um, using them or growing them in a dish, potentially taking from our self and editing them as we need. Um, so for example, say we have an immune deficiency how can we restore immune competence to this hematopoietic stem cell? And so we believe that using the knowledge that we gain from these developmentally restricted HSCs, that we can then um, apply that to hematopoietic stem cell uh, therapies. But specifically what I plan on doing is using CRISPR technologies. It's a uh, very powerful tool that was discovered almost 10 years ago and it's really taken off. So it gives us the ability to um, edit and manipulate the genome as we wish. And um, so my goal moving forward is to use this uh, tool to manipulate hematopoietic stem cell function and hopefully find uh, the cures for, <laughs> uh, for many diseases, but actually being able to take our own stem cells and do it in this way. Okay. You guys like development? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. What about aging? Yeah. <laughs> aging is a beautiful thing. Donna's going to tell you guys about that. Thank you, Josh. Okay, so you've seen this slide before. And <clears throat> Atesh and I have been trying to convince you of the vital importance of blood and how this is right maintain uh, for the balance of our body. But what happens when we get old? Does the blood gain wrinkles and gray hairs like we do? As we get older, the prevalence of stroke increases dramatically, with the incidence doubling with each decade after age 40 years old, for both men and women. And to really deliver the news, the uh, statistics are quite bleak. Someone dies of a stroke every three minutes, accounting for 300, almost 400 deaths per day. In the U.S., someone has a stroke every 40 seconds, and could suffer a long-term disability. So the aging of blood represents us with a serious clinical challenge with age-related diseases like stroke. And in my PhD, I'm really interested in understanding how does the blood age? And I'm paying particular attention to these small cells called platelets that Atesh had talked about previously. Platelets serve many vitally important functions in the blood, but one of their well-recognized functions is their cooperative response to stick to each other 
if you will, to um, form clots and stop bleeding. However, as in many other aging tissues, these platelets' properties change during aging. Platelets are produced at different rates and their response to damage diminishes. As a result, platelets in the old blood are more likely to generate pathological clots that lead to cardiovascular diseases like stroke. And this high prevalence of platelet-related disorders in the elderly is made even more tangible by the, universally, the truth universally acknowledged that we're all getting old. And we're all going to be 65 years old one day. And in fact, by the year 2050, the age of population in the U.S. alone will grow to be over 83 million people. That's a lot of grandmas and grandmas. So the important challenge is then to understand the cellular and molecular reasons for the prevalence of these platelet-related disorders upon aging. And the overarching bigger mystery here really is how does the blood age? And I'm going to share with you an absolutely amazing discovery that Atesh alluded to in aging research that may revolutionize the way we think about aging of the blood and how we treat age-related disorders in the future. And of course, it's almost impossible to think about aging of the blood without thinking about the hematopoietic stem cell. Again, here is our tree of blood. And to recap, in a healthy adult blood, HSCs are gradually restricted to committed progenitor cells in the bone marrow, which then give rise to a balanced set of mature and functional cellular components of our blood that serve life-sustaining um, properties. During aging, however, our HSCs also age and decline in functionality. This stem cell dysfunction is manifested by reduced regenerative potential, a skewing in lineage fate choice, meaning there is a bias in production of platelets, red blood cells, and granulocytes and macrophages at the expense of B and T cells. Um, so there is an imbalance of cell production on this side of the tree. And the greatest irony of all, we somehow make so much more hematopoietic stem cells. I think we have an order of like, I don't know, 60% more hematopoietic stem cells compared to a, in, in an old mouse compared to a young mouse. Um, but to this day, no one really knows why this tree, old tree, if you will, looks like this, or how the cellular and molecular alterations cause or is a consequence of aging in the aging blood. In our lab, aging began with the flex switch experiments, and I'm going to uh, repeat this again. Um, if you remember, the HSCs are tomato positive, or red, whatever you want to call them. And all downstream lineages, starting in the progenitors, are green positive. And the switcher is irreversible, meaning once it's green, uh, it and its progeny remain green. So in the flip switch mouse, the cells are either tomato or green. And what I want you to remember is that the stem cells are tomato, and all downstream lineages are green. But of course, things never stay quite the same when we get older. When we track the blood of these mice as they age, we notice something very interesting. So here are more fast plots. Um, in this case, um, uh, they're represented as dots. So each dot represents a cell. And here you're looking at plots of blood analysis at three months old, uh, three month old mouse, flip switch mouse. And we get what we expect. We get majority, if not all of our cells, um, in platelets, granulocytes and macrophages, B and T cells, are all green positive. But at 24 months old, which is basically considered an old mouse, so a mouse lives from up to maybe 24 to 26 months, we see this novel population of platelets that are tomato positive. Meanwhile, and what's also really interesting is that not, uh, this is not observed in all of our other cell types, which maintain their 
green color. Here you can see GMs or granulocytes and macrophages are green. B and T cells are also green. And so we see this unique population of platelets that are tomato positive. And here is uh, what this change looks like over the lifespan of a mouse. I've mentioned they live up to about 24 months. And this graph depicts the percentage of green cells within each cell compartment over time. And what we can appreciate is that GMs or granulocytes and macrophages, B and T cells maintain high percentages of green cell population throughout the life and therefore maintain the canonical green path. But the platelets, which is this pink line right here, have departed from the canonical green path and instead undergo a unique tomato uh, positive differentiation pathway. And this is observed as early as 12 months and becomes most pronounced right here from 18 to 24 months. And when we put the other pieces of the tree together during aging, we also see that hematopoietic stem cells maintain their tomato color. And we observe that the immediate progenitor of these tomato positive platelets, which is the megakaryocyte progenitor, or MKP for short, is also tomato positive while all other cells are green. And so here, we've discovered that these platelets are selectively affected by aging and deviate from the canonical green positive pathway of mice. This discovery of a platelet pathway that is unique to aging, giving rise to two distinct platelet populations will revolutionize the way we think about aging and the way we study them. It provides us a unique opportunity to investigate mechanisms responsible for many platelet-related disorders and diseases that plague the elderly. And we predict that this age-specific pathway is what contributes to dysfunction and increased risk for these platelet-related disorders in, in the elderly. And so now, this gives us a model to look at cells specific to the old state. In the lab, I've begun to test the functional differences of, of these two distinct platelet uh, populations in the old mass. Uh, so we have the H-specific tomato-positive platelet. They're coexisting green-positive platelet comparing those to the young green platelets. And I think I've mentioned that the primary role of a platelet in circulation is to help maintain blood flow within the vessel. And so I'm tackling, uh, understanding the function of these platelets in three stages, and I'm going to be talking about that here. And so when the blood vessel is presented with an injury, like this one, platelets quickly respond to the site of injury. And this response is dynamic and typically thought to occur in three stages, starting with platelets adhering to the site of injury, and this adhesion causes an activation of the platelets. This activation results in a morphological change of the platelets from a plate shape to one that's more wrinkled like this one. And then the platelets aggregate to form a clot that we're more familiar with. And so this is what happens in the young to promote wound healing, but in the old, it is likely that age-related platelet hyperreactivity contributes to the high prevalence of pathological clots or thrombosis, like stroke, cardiovascular diseases. Yet little is known about the mechanisms of that drive these changes in platelet biology as we age, and we've begun to test the hypothesis that it's the old, uh, specific, tomato-positive platelets that might be functionally different and contributing to uh, these um, the, the impairment of uh, platelet function during aging. However, it, it remains unknown really the difference in function of, between these two platelet populations. We don't know if the age-specific platelets are the culprits of the age-related disorders that I've been alluding you to, but really they could maybe serve as a safety mechanism to alleviate these age-related uh, decline of the canonical platelets in other disorders. Maybe they're good. Um, and 
And so if H specific platelets are these tomato positive platelets are indeed hyperactive as in the context of stroke, my goal is to reduce their numbers and or activity to avert pathological clots. And therefore, my goal is to control platelet differentiation pathways to improve the quality of life of the aging population. All right, well, hopefully tonight we have um, taught you a few things about hematopoiesis and blood development, and really, hopefully that when you go home tonight, you can really appreciate the complexity of uh, blood development throughout life from the very beginning, starting in embryonic, um, very early embryonic days, all the way to uh, the aged population and how these stem cells are able to change and respond to the environment. Um, and really, I think what we wanted to do was highlight how understanding these stem cell functions throughout life is really, really important when we're thinking of trying to uh, cure diseases in terms of using hematopoietic stem cells for transplantation therapies, but also in terms of just trying to improve the quality of life. Um, so, hopefully you leave today understanding the importance of blood. Um, yeah, is there anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, <yeah. laughs> awesome, well thank you so much. All of this work cannot be done uh, in isolation. We work very closely with all of our lab mates, some of whom are here today. Um, and science is really a collaborative effort. And not only that, uh, we rely a lot on funding to do all of this work. So both Donna and I have received funding um, from many sources. Dawn is currently funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institution and was previously funded by uh, the American Heart Association. And I've just received a grant from the Tobacco Related Disease Research uh, Program in California to do this work. Um, but our lab also has been funded in the past by CERM, so I'm not sure if you've heard of CERM. California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Gosh, there it is. <laughs> Taxpayers' dollars, so everyone in the thank room. Thank you. Yes, thank you. This is <laughs> science is more than just us. It is really everyone here today. So I'd like to thank you all for that. Um, and yeah, awesome. So I think we're transitioning okay. over to our question and answer portion of the evening. And so if you have any questions, please just raise your hand, and I'll let the speakers kind of wait for that. And if you could just repeat the question before you answer, that would be great. So are there any questions? Please. Yes. So. Uh, Let's go way back. Where uh, everybody starts as a single cell, am I correct? Correct. And is that cell a stem cell? So and it multiplies. He, mm -hmm. okay. So the question is, we all start as one cell, and is that single cell a stem cell? Yes, that is an embryonic stem cell, and uh, it is an oligopotent cell, meaning it create all of the cells in our body. Uh, so it keeps splitting, uh, I'm, I'm getting to my question, I don't know. so it keeps splitting and at some point it stops and starts to develop a, a, a body, mm -hmm. right? It differentiates itself. Yes. Uh, so how many, when does the process of stem cells stop, we have, basically, we have so many stem cells, and that's it. Okay, so, and to they repopulate, and then and okay. differentiate, and then they get used up, and then how do new ones get made, or does it So, stop? In sp specifically that embryonic stem cell, or stem cells throughout life, how do we... Stem cells throughout life, because okay. it seems like there's going to be a certain number, mm -hmm. Uh, and then it's going to start making differentiating. Yes, yes. So we whatever have... mechanism we don't know, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, throughout our life, we only have so many stem cells. Is that what I'm saying? It is dependent on the tissue, yes. But so throughout development, every stage of development, we uh, develop different tissues, and each tissue has a tissue specific stem cell. So for blood, the hematopoietic stem cell. Um, some tissues do not necessarily generate throughout, regenerate throughout life, like the brain, there's not 
Uh, it's thought that the brain does not regenerate in adulthood, the eye, yes. Um, whereas we have our skin that is constantly turning over, and so those epithelial skin stem cells are working all the time, just like our blood stem cells. Our liver stem cells, which are there, have the ability to regenerate upon injury. Same with all of our, our intestine. So um, it's, there's a very fine balance, this balance between self-renewal and making more of stem cells and differentiating is very finely tuned through each, or through each tissue in the body. And so um, there are programs internally, we think, that control the number of cells, uh, pool of cells for that tissue in specific. So uh, am I correct in saying at some point that starts breaking down as you get older? Potentially, it depends on uh, well, it, it depends on um, the tissue, so, yeah, some tissues uh, become much worse at regenerating as we get older, and that is definitely due to stem cells' uh, inability to regenerate, yeah. And that's what you're looking at? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yes, you're right. I am looking at the uh, reduced uh, stemness of, of an old stem cell. And so although we have a lot of them, they're functionally uh, less. Um, they're like less likely to regenerate. They're less likely to make uh, healthy cells. Um, yeah, so when you say break down, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, stem cells in aging tissues do get tired. <laughs> so did you just indicate that the, uh, the tissues in the eye do not regenerate? I don't think so. Yeah. Do they? I don't think they do. Would stem cells help an eye issue? Um, Could you repeat the question, yeah. please? Yeah, so the question was, does the eye regenerate? And we responded, no. And then she asked, can stem cells regenerate the eye? Um, and so, theoretically, yes. Um, um, and, I mean, so there are therapies currently that are being developed to deliver stem cells to the back of the eye to regenerate portions of it. Um, Clegg? Um, yeah. There's a, yes, he's working on, thank you, Eric. Um, uh, there's this researcher working on creating scaffolds for stem cells to put the scaffold on the stem cell and then transplant that into the back of the eye with the hopes of that regenerating um, the portions of the eye that have degenerated. And I think there is some indication that it is successful, but it's very tricky. The whole idea of uh, stem cell transplant therapy, other than the blood, has, is hotly debated. So I'm not sure if you've heard of all the stem cell clinics that are popping up around the world that are not FDA approved. The doctors who are running them, some of them, actually a lot of them, are not actually board certified, but they're peddling this idea that you can just take a young stem cell, put it in an old uh, tissue and it will regenerate, and that's just not the case. That was my next question. Yes. What about uh, joints that uh, are arthritic? Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, what about joints that are arthritic? What happens if you put stem cells in there to repair the joint? And, you know, that's a great question, and people are definitely working on that, but a big thing that needs to be considered when we are talking about these types of stem cell transplant therapies is you are taking a healthy stem cell and putting it into an environment that itself is detrimental to the stem cell. So to think that we can take this healthy stem cell and it will survive in that environment um, is not very logical in the end. So people are trying, but it's, Thank you. don't go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. or don't regenerate? The cells in the nervous system do not regenerate uh, very poorly, if at all. If at all, yeah. Some, a lot of nerve injury cannot repair itself, correct? Yes, <laughs> yeah, I think so too, but uh, the nerve, <laughs> but also it's this weird balance because we also need uh, the circulation of nerves to generate certain tissues. Um, and so we need both. For example, when we break our bone, we need uh, nerve circulation around the fracture to stimulate regeneration. Um, 
And so while they are necessary for many regenerative properties, I don't know if they themselves can have the intrinsic capacity to regenerate. Yes. So you just mentioned some non-board certified doctors that are out of doing some of their own science. There's a lot of, not a lot, but there's some avenue where young blood is supposed to make older people younger based on what you're saying, you may have some validity since they would have the newer um, proper stem cells. Yeah, so the question is putting young blood into an older person, an older person to rejuvenate right. the old blood. Is that real? Is that what your question is? Well, it sounds yeah. like that might yeah, no, that's you know, certain. You know, the, uh, mm -hmm. something that might happen. Yeah, no, it's happening. Um, uh, I don't know in people, I don't know very well, but certainly in mice. Um, and there are a lot of uh, groups uh, looking at these uh, exchange of blood. Um, and specifically, they're interested in you know these circulating factors that uh, might be uh, you know like youthful. Um, and they do find that from these uh, circulating molecules, they you can uh, improve, uh, for example, cardiac health, uh, brain function. Um, so certainly there is uh, validity to um, to circulating factors having an effect on um, properties of aged tissues. If you're interested in that, there's a researcher at UC Berkeley, I mean a convoy. And her husband Michael Convoy, they have a lab there. And there was a great podcast recently uh, that interviewed them. I think it was called, it's, the podcast is STEM Talks. Correct. And uh, episode 92 or something, 93. Um, I would listen to, they, this is what they study. They study um, parabiosis experiments where they take a young mouse and an old mouse, sew them together so they share a, a circulatory system, and then look at injury in the old mouse. Does having young factors affect it? In some cases, yes, but um, the big thing that they note is that there might be pro youthful factors, but there are also uh, pro aging factors in the old blood. So, can taking young blood, putting into old uh, organism, is that enough to overcome the environment, the old environment? So that is a question that's being pursued. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. So my friend, who's my age, he gives uh, platelets very often. And now I'm seeing there's two different kinds of platelets. Now, does it make a difference? I mean, if he has the wrong kind of platelets, yeah, are those people getting more strokes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so the question is, her friend is uh, donating platelets and she doesn't know if they're good or bad. Um, I don't either, unfortunately. Um, we don't really know what her platelet uh, heterogeneity looks like in humans, and that's, um, I guess, the next logical step after studying in mice. Um, which is hopefully what I'll be doing. I mean, that'd be really cool. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I imagine in people, there is a, a wide number of different kinds of platelets, um, not just two. So um, and I think uh, also, aren't there limitations to um, age in, in a platelet donation? At least in a budget level. <laughs>
We are now going to transition over to the sci-fi portion of our sci-fi versus science night, where we're going to be watching the fantastic voyage. So grab another drink, hang out. Thank you so much. Thank you.